Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Casey Blake. I'm director of Columbia's Center for American Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's panel discussion on the history and legacy of the Supreme Court's 1944 Korematsu decision from Japanese American internment to the Trump administration's travel ban. The Center for American Studies has civic education as its mission, and to that end, sponsors seminars and public programs that bring historical perspective to bear on the most pressing public events of the day. Tonight's panel, organized by my colleague Michael Hindus, is an example of that commitment. We believe, with John Dewey, that the past is a great resource for the imagination. It adds a new dimension to life, but on condition that it be seen as the past of the present and not as another and disconnected world. Um, I'm sorry to say before we begin that Peter Irons, who's really one of the heroes of the Korematsu story, is not able to be here and he sends his regrets. I have a number of people to thank before we get started, uh, beginning with the center's assistant director, Angela Darling, and her assistant, Lakin King, who have worked for several months on logistics for this event. I want also to thank the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, the Department of History, and the American Constitution Society for co-sponsoring this event. And I'm also very grateful to the Jack Miller, uh, Jack Miller Center for its financial support uh, for this evening's event. Most of all, I want to thank my colleague Michael Hindus for everything that he's done to organize this panel. Michael graduated from Columbia College as a proud member of the class of 1968 and went on to take a PhD in history at Berkeley before going on to Harvard Law School and from there to a major career in energy law. He is the author of Prison and Plantation, Crime, Justice, and Authority in Massachusetts and South Carolina, 1767 to 1878, and more than a dozen articles in legal history. Michael is currently a lecturer in history and American studies where he teaches a seminar on American legal history that is an important part of the American studies curriculum. He is also chair of the center's board of visitors. So thank you, Michael, for all your hard work over many months now to make tonight's event happen. And so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. In 1942, fueled by the racist hysteria that followed Pearl Harbor, over 120,000 Japanese Americans, two thirds of whom were citizens, were sent to incar incarceration camps. There are countless stories which can be told about this shameful episode in American history. And thanks to genuine heroes like Karen Korematsu, those stories are being told. Two of the panelists have a direct connection to the incarceration. Karen Tani's grandparents met in one of the camps, and Karen Korematsu, born after the war, is the daughter of Fred Korematsu. Of the many ways to discuss this, the incarceration, today we are focusing on one, which is legal history. The cases of the brave Americans who defied the law and took their cases to the Supreme Court. The efforts to exonerate them decades later based on a smoking gun, and the legacy of the court decision, decisions that extend to this June's Supreme Court decision on Trump's travel ban. Now I want to introduce our panelists. Professor Karen Tani is the Samuel Rubin Visiting Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and comes to the law school from the Faculty of Berkeley Law. The first graduate of Penn's JD PhD program in American Legal History, her book, States of Dependency, won the 2017 Cromwell Book Award of the American Society for Legal History. Our next speaker will be Karen Korematsu. She has devoted her career to carrying on the legacy of her father, Fred Korematsu. 
She is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, dedicating to edu educating people about the incarceration by preparing educational materials, speaking throughout the world, and apart from the Institute, participating in cases such as the travel ban to support her father's values. She also participated in the Quorum Nobis proceeding, which led to the overturning of her father's conviction, and was instrumental in California establishing the annual Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Now, when you hear people bash California, think about that. We have a Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Our last speaker is Adam Lipak, Lip, Liptak. He is the Supreme Court correspondent for the New York Times. He started as a copy boy in 1984. Do they even have them anymore? <laughs> <laughs> a graduate so of Yale Law School, he has been at the Times since 1992, first as a lawyer, and then in, 19, in 2008 began covering the Supreme Court. Mr. Liptak is one of the most influential observers of the court today. So without further ado, let me, let me begin with Karen Tani. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the legal history that we are about to uh, discuss. And I should first say I'm a very poor replacement for Peter Irons, who is a genuine expert on this subject. Um, I was literally a toddler in 1983 when he was part of Fred Korematsu's legal team. Like, that is how deep his knowledge is. Uh, but I hope that in other ways I am the right person for this job. So as mentioned, my grandparents met in Minidoka and married shortly thereafter. And I really feel that I grew up in the shadow of the history I'm about to describe to you. Indeed, it is one of the reasons that I became both a law professor and a historian. So I'll start with Pearl Harbor. Uh, in the weeks following, the public clamored for the removal of Japanese Americans from the West Coast, drawing on the kind of nativist, anti-Asian rhetoric that had long circulated in even polite society. Finally, in February of 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. Uh, this order conferred on the Secretary of War authority to designate military zones from which, quote, any or all persons may be excluded. Now, the order on its face said nothing about detention, nothing about any particular racial or ethnic group, but Roosevelt and everyone around him understood the stakes. So before Roosevelt signed the order, it was clear that military authorities envisioned a mass evacuation of people of Japanese descent, including American citizens. The thinking uh, within the War Department was that Nisei, that is second generation Japanese Americans, posed in fact a great threat, a greater threat, they said, than their immigrant parents. So the War Department argued that if left alone, um, the, the Nisei would engage in espionage and sabotage. Now, these claims were dubious and indeed contradicted by contemporaneous uh, reports from the Navy and the FBI, as would later become known. Um, and even if they had some basis in fact, they would not have justified uh, mass evacuation. But nonetheless, they were the arguments that carried the day within the executive branch. So lawyers we now know within the Justice Department raised serious constitutional questions, but ultimately everyone stood down. And one of the great failures, I think, of the legal profession. With Executive Order 9066 in hand, General John DeWitt, commander of the Western Defense Force, quickly launched a program of mass evacuation of Japanese Americans from their West Coast homes. By March of 1942, this program had Congress's stamp of approval in the form of a law criminalizing noncompliance with military orders, Public Law 503. By the end of October, 112,000 persons of Japanese ancestry had been placed under guard in so-called relocation centers, um, and as Michael said, I think incarceration is the more apt description. I'll turn now to the four young Nisei who challenged this program and whose cases ultimately reached the Supreme Court. Their names are Minoru Yasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, Fred Korematsu, and Mitsuye Endo. So Minoru Yasui, uh, who is not well known, was a US military veteran, the American-born son of two Japanese immigrants. On March 28, 1942, he walked into a Portland, Oregon police station, and he demanded that police arrest him for violating General DeWitt's curfew order, an order that applied only to persons of Japanese descent, and that was essentially a preliminary step in the broader evacuation uh, and incarceration plan. Yasui's aim was to create a test case to challenge the constitutionality of the order. 
Six weeks later, Gordon Hirabayashi had a similar idea. He was a senior then at the University of Washington. Uh, he reported to the location where he was supposed to register for evacuation, and then he refused to fill out the paperwork. He was duly charged and thus began a second test case challenging the constitutionality of the General DeWitt's evacuation order. At that time, Hirabayashi was also charged with violating the curfew order, a point that will become important uh, down the line. Fred Korematsu's encounter with authorities was less deliberate. So the police in San Leandro, California, picked him up on May 30th, 1942, when he was walking down the street with his girlfriend. Korematsu's failure to report for evacuation resulted in criminal charges for violating military orders. Last but not least was Mitsuye Endo, a 22-year-old American citizen who had been a clerical worker for the California DMV before executive order, the executive order came out. So unlike the other three, she dutifully um, followed the orders, but then used a habeas corpus petition to challenge her confinement. And this case had far-reaching implications, because a decision that Endo's det detention was unlawful would require the release of all other Japanese Americans who were similarly situated. Okay, so I'll tell you now about how these four cases played out. So predictably, government lawyers won convictions for all the trials, um, the criminal trials, so the trials of all the Japanese Americans charged with violating General DeWitt's orders, so Yasui, Hirabayashi, and Korematsu. The defendant's lawyers promptly appealed, uh, alleging that these orders violated the Constitution. Um, and uh, so they made basically two arguments, and these will come at, up in the cases. One about um, claiming there had been an unconstitutional delegation of Congress's legislative power to military officials, and a second claim about violation of the Fifth Amendment by singling out citizens of Japanese ancestry. Okay, so these three appeals were consolidated, meaning that the Court of Appeals um, of the Ninth Circuit heard them all together. Um, that court, however, decided not to rule on the questions that those cases presented, and instead to certify the questions to the Supreme Court. So in April 1943, the court agreed to take all three. At this point, the case has become uh, uncoupled. So the court sent the Korematsu case back down to the Ninth Circuit for a decision on the legality of the evacuation order. Um, and as for the Hirabayashi case, the court decided it on narrow grounds after a month of a serious internal debate. And you're, if you're interested in that debate, I really encourage you to read uh, Peter Iron's book, Justice at War. Um, ultimately, Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone, a Columbia Law grad, by the way, uh, was able to get all his colleagues to agree to uphold here by Yashi's conviction, but only by finding a technical reason to avoid considering the evacuation order, what he wanted to challenge, and instead focusing entirely on the curfew order. So I'll walk us now briefly through the court's reasoning. As you'll see, the key factor here is deference to Congress and the executive in the face of apparent military necessity. Okay, so the court began by joining together Executive Order 9066 and the Congressional Act that ratified and confirmed it. This joint action the court said was an exercise of Congress and the President's power to wage war. Okay, so what is this power to wage war? Where does it come from? It comes from the Constitution, the court explains, and it extends to every matter and activity so related to war as substantially to affect its conduct and progress. In other words, this is a vast power. Necessarily, the court continued, this power comes with, quote, wide scope for the exercise of judgment and discretion, discretion in determining where danger lies and how best to resist it. It is not our role, the court essentially said, to substitute our judgment for theirs. The court went on to recount its understanding of the conditions facing Congress and the President in early 1942, and it signaled that it was prepared to treat the curfew as a valid exercise of the war power if there were, quote, any substantial basis for the conclusion that the curfew was a necessary protective. Uh, in other words, the court set the bar for the government very low. Now, this part of the opinion is important because it makes clear that the court relied heavily on government representations, a point that we'll return to later. And so here are those, some, some of those representations. The government lawyers emphasize the vast concentration of war-related industry in the military zones. They, they claimed that the only expedient alternatives to the curfew that General DeWitt ordered was a curfew that covered everyone or a curfew that covered no one, like no curfew at all. They framed it in that way. And finally, and I think most importantly, um, government lawyers told the court, and the court accepted, that American-born children of Japanese immigrants really did have cultural and effective ties to Japan, and that they had weaker ties to the United States 
because they were less assimilated. Now, this part of the opinion is um, deeply ironic because it became essentially a plus factor for the government's case that American law had long discriminated against people of Japanese descent, including with regards to, for example, property ownership uh, and intermarriage. These discriminatory acts, the court explained, made it all the more believable that Japanese Americans might undermine the war effort. Ultimately, the court found that Congress and the executive had cleared the very low bar that it had set. Now, as for whether there was something unconstitutional about, about an order that distinguished between citizens solely because of their ancestry, the court basically put it this way. So they said, yes, we have said that such distinctions are um, odious, that they are denial of the right to equal protection of the laws, but wartime is exceptional, and we would not want to preclude Congress and the executive from taking race or, quote, national extraction into account. And then the court simply rehashed its earlier conclusion. So here's a quote. We cannot say that these facts and circumstances considered in the particular war setting could afford no ground for differentiating citizens of Japanese ancestry from other groups. In other words, again, a very low bar here for the government to clear. The case also had several concurrences, and here we catch a glimpse of the doubts that were nagging at some of the justices. So nothing in the court's decision, Justice Frank Murphy emphasized, should be interpreted to mean that constitutionally protected rights and liberties were simply suspended in wartime. Quote, there are constitutional boundaries which it is our duty to uphold. Murphy then went on to signal how troubled he was by an order that divided citizens based on ancestry. Such distinctions, he wrote, are utterly inconsistent with our traditions and ideals and at variance with the principles for which we are now waging war. He also noted the curfew's, quote, melancholy resemblance to the persecution of Jews in Germany. Uh, ultimately, though, Murphy, too, was persuaded by the government's arguments about military necessity, um, but he did signal that the curfew was close to the line. Okay, so what did this mean? So most immediately, the decision in Hirabayashi decided Min Yasui's case as well. So the court unanimously upheld Yasui's con conviction, which was also um, had to do with the curfew. This case also had an effect on the Endo case, the fourth case I mentioned to you. So during all of this time, Endo's habeas petition had essentially been languishing before a district court judge who appeared to be awaiting guidance from the Supreme Court. So shortly after the Supreme Court issued its decision in Hirabayashi, that district court judge uh, then dismissed Endo's case. Endo then was able to appeal, and the Ninth Circuit certified the case to the Supreme Court. Okay, so at this point, the Korematsu and the Endo cases were ready for decision by the Supreme Court. This is now the spring of 1944. So recall the Korematsu case had gone back down to the Ninth Circuit. It had now made its way back up. And the court heard both cases in October of 1944. So, as you all know, I suspect, the court voted to uphold Fred Korematsu's conviction for violating the exclusion order in a decision with vast ramifications. Uh, and writing for the majority, Justice Hugo Black essentially tracked the logic of the Hirabayashi case. So basically, he said, we can't conclude that this evacuation decision was beyond the war power because there was some basis, some minimal basis, for believing that some segment of this group was disloyal and because uh, there was some basis for believing that it would have been impossible to distinguish the loyal from the disloyal in an expedient way. So note again in this case the heavy reliance on information provided by the government. So they're kind of rehashing all of these government claims. By 1944, the government was also able to claim that its suspicions in 1942 about disloyalty had been borne out. And here again, I would say we see a very sad irony. So some of the evidence that the government cited and that the court in turn cited in its opinion came from the government's imposition of a loyalty oath on its citizens and the understandable refusal of thousands of citizens to sign it. Right? The court said, oh, this is perfect evidence right, of disloyalty. <coughs> Now, Justice Black um, acknowledged the hardships that the exclusion order had imposed on a particular group of citizens, but said, quote, hardships are part of war, and war is an aggregation of hardships. When under conditions of modern warfare, our shores are threatened by hostile forces, the power prote to protect must be commensurate with the threatened danger. 
Now, Justice Black's opinion uh, in Korematsu has sometimes actually been cited favorably for some language at the beginning. So at the beginning, he actually says, quote, all legal restrictions which curtail the civil rights of a single racial group are immediately suspect. So that language, right, some people have said, you know, that's good law. But this language cannot be detached from the last paragraph where he writes that any effort to cast this case in terms of racial prejudice, quote, merely confuses the issue. He says Korematsu was not excluded from the military area because of hostility to him or his race. That was uh, Justice Black's view. The case includes several powerful dissents. So Justice Owen Roberts saw the exclusion order for what it was, quote, part of an overall plan for forcible detention, and thus resisted the narrow grounds on which the majority decided the case. He saw the case as a clear violation of constitutional rights. Uh, Justice Murphy's dissent uh, ex basically extended his argument in Hayabayashi, stating that it, the exclusion order, in contrast to the curfew order, went over, quote, the very brink of constitutional power and into the ugly abyss of racism. Uh, Murphy's dissent also called out the majority for its reliance on dubious racial and sociological assumptions, on unproven intimations about minor acts of sabotage, and at heart on prejudice. Uh, where a military judgment, he said, is based on these kinds of considerations, it is not entitled to the degree of deference it has gotten here. He concluded by calling the majority's decision, quote, a legalization of racism. Uh, last but not least, there was a dissent from Justice Robert Jackson. I'll quote for you the most famous part. So here he is distinguishing between the danger of a military order, like this evacuation order on the one hand, and a Supreme Court opinion that declares such an order to be in conformity with the Constitution. The court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Every repetition embeds that principle more deeply in our law and law and thinking and expands it to new purposes. Jackson continues, a military commander may overstep the bounds of constitutionality and if they do so, that's an incident. But if we, the court, review and approve, that passing incident becomes the doctrine of the Constitution. There, it has a generative power of its own, and all that it creates will be in its own image. Presciently, Jackson warned his readers not to look uh, to the courts as the primary guardians of liberty against military power. Uh, in the moment when liberty is under assault, he suggested the people must exert political pressure. They must also look back at past military decisions he suggested and with the distance of time make moral judgments about them, the work that we are doing today. Uh, the case that most squarely raised the constitutionality of the Japanese internment is the last one that the court decided, Mitsuye Endo's appeal of the denial of her habeas petition. Uh, Endo, I would say, is an unsung hero, and here is why. So after she filed her petition, government authorities offered to release her in return for her agreement not to return to the restricted area of the West Coast. And she declined because she knew that accepting release would moot her case, would make it so that the, the court didn't have to hear it. And she wanted the Supreme Court to consider this issue. So she remained confined uh, for another two years, basically, to preserve this habeas case. So finally, the court decides it. On D December 18th, 1944, a unanimous court concluded that Endo must be given her liberty. Um, but once again, the court found a way to minimize its criticism of President Roosevelt and of the military and to avoid a vital constitutional question. So essentially, the court, it's a very clever move. The court shifted blame to the War Relocation Authority, which is the civilian agency um, that was created to confine and manage all the Japanese Americans who had been forcefully evacuated. And then the court held that that civilian agency had exceeded the authority granted to it by Congress and the executive. So it sort of shifted the blame uh, in a way that, again, sort of um, took the focus um, really off of, um, off of the president and off of Congress. Um, this was simply a clever dodge, the two concurring justices noted, and was at odds with what everyone in Congress and the executive branch understood at the time as they literally you know, funneled money and guidance toward that agency's work. 
uh, the timing of the case was consistent with the court's narrow holding. So the, although it appears that the court uh, had reached its decision in November, it was, ready, it was ready to go. This was before the 1944 election. The court did not announce its decision until after the election, and in fact announced it one day after a military proclamation declared that all Japanese uh, American evacuees were free to return to their homes on the West Coast. So in other words, even the Supreme Court's uh, timid reproach came a day too late. Can you hear me? Sort of? This thing is weird. Good evening. Um, well, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's uh, a real honor to uh, be with you this evening. I see uh, uh, many friends uh, here in the audience. And uh, even though um, the professor had mentioned uh, Fred, T Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties for California, we also have uh, Fred Korematsu Day um, of Civil Liberties in the Constitution, which is our poster here, for New York City. And many here in the audience um, were, uh, were uh, part of that organizing uh, committee that, uh, that made that happen. Uh, Councilman Daniel Drum was instrumental in having that uh, uh, put through um, your New York City Council. And so actually January 30th earlier this year in freezing cold weather, uh, because I live in San Francisco, we had a, a, a great celebration, had a, um, a press conference uh, on the uh, steps of City Hall, and then it started snowing. So <laughs> um, I know my father would have been cold if he were here. Um, and, but certainly was a great um, celebration, and we're very proud to uh, be able to share with you Fred Korematsu Day. It's also uh, honored in the state of Hawaii, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, as they like to be known, and even Florida. Um, the push is uh, to have a, a nationwide, um, quote, holiday, which I'm sure you would like to have, uh, but uh, uh, we're working on it. But it's wonderful to have a day that's named after my father. He's the first um, Asian American in U.S. history to have a day named after him. And you know, he represents all those Asian Americans and, and Middle Easterns and, and Muslims and South Asians and all those that have been marginalized. And that's, and that's really what the day represents. It represents um, our civil liberties and the Constitution, what my father fought for for the rest of his life. So um, I, I, my father was born in Oakland, California, so therefore he was an American citizen. And uh, when this executive order was, was issued, you know, he, he really couldn't believe it. He, th he thought maybe something might happen to his parents uh, because they were, they were immigrants. But he was a, a, a U.S. citizen, and he learned about the Constitution in high school. He was paying attention that day. So I tell everyone, you know, study the Constitution. You never know when you're going to need uh, to be aware of your, of your rights. Um, so, you know, it was really quite um, a shock because he, he thought, why should he go to a prison camp when he had done nothing wrong? Uh, and he, he just really wanted to live his life as, as an American. And so that's why he, you know, changed his, his uh, draft card. This girlfriend that, that kind of keeps popping up was actually Italian-American, not my mother. My mother says she would have never deserted my father. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and you know, then my my father never even saw her um, after he was was uh, arrested. Never saw her again. So, and of course, there was conflict between the Italians and the Japanese, certainly as well. So that's another um, part of the story. Uh, but when he he was arrested. Um, on uh, May 30th, 1942, um, actually, no one kind of knew what to do with him. Uh, he went from jail to jail and ended up in federal jail in San Francisco. And it was actually Mr. Ernest Besick, who was then the executive director of the Northern California affiliate of the ACLU, that read about my father's uh, being arrested uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle. 
and Mr. Besick had been looking for a test case. So he visited my dad in jail, and my dad thought, well, who, he doesn't know anybody. You know, it's his family's in, in this prison camp, and, and all his other uh, Caucasian buddies would, went off to, to war. And so Mr. Besick appeared and asked, asked my father if he would be willing to, uh, you know, fight his case. And Mr. Besick said, if need be, we will take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And my dad thought, for sure, by the time it, it reached the Supreme Court, that they would see it was con unconstitutional. But um, he, he was sent over um, after the bail, bail hearing, uh, even though he, he was given bail, uh, the MPs were waiting for him outside the courthouse because if you were you know, Japanese or Japanese American, you could not be you know, out in, in public on, on the West Coast. You were put into the detention assembly centers before you shipped off to, uh, to one of the 10 Japanese American incarceration camps. And by the way, Minidoka is, is in Idaho outside of Twin Falls. Uh, and, but my, my family ended up, my grandparents and my father and his brothers ended up in Topaz, Utah. So he, my father was sent over to the San Francisco Presidio, which was the home of the Fourth Army, General John DeWitt's office, where he, he issued over a um, hundred exclusion orders that forcibly removed anyone of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. And these military zones were half of Oregon, uh, Washington, all of California, even half of Arizona. And, uh, and he's the one really that encouraged President Roosevelt uh, to issue this executive order. Uh, and the, Mr. Besick was even threatened with ouster from his own uh, uh, organization because um, you know, he wanted to take on my father's case. And uh, the uh, uh, executive director of the, um, uh, Roger Baldwin, the executive director of the ACLU at the time, um, said no, we don't, you know, take on cases. You know, maybe amicus briefs, friends of the court. But he, Mr. Besick, was threatened with ouster, and he's another hero because he was determined to keep going with my father's case. So my father was then sent over to uh, the uh, Tan Ferran uh, racetrack, the detention ce center in San Bruno, California, that was outside of in the Bay Area, outside of San Francisco, and it was a racetrack, right? And, and you know, when my father got there, he said, gee, jail was a lot better than this. Because you know, the, the horse stalls were just whitewashed with manure. I mean, whitewashed, they smelled like manure anyway. And you had a, a, a light bulb, dirt on the floor, gaps in the walls, and a, and a, and a cotton sleeve or a flour sack that you had to stuff with, with straw, and that was your mattress. And people had to live like that for three, three or four months before they were sent off to the permanent um, uh, incarceration camps. And, and so you know, that's part of the story that, that sometimes is not told. And that's why you know, we keep repeating these uh, inhumane acts, separating families from chil you know, f parents from, from children. Uh, and so that's, that's what keeps me, me going in, in trying to educate people. But uh, no one wanted to, anything to do with my father when he arrived at, at uh, Tan Ferran. Uh, actually, the, there were men that, uh, in the community that decided to have a meeting. They didn't even invite my father to the meeting to, to determine whether or not my father should carry on fighting his case. And then after the meeting, my, my dad asked his older brother, well, what happened? And they said, well, Fred, you know, we don't want you to fight your case because some harm might come to, the, to us. And so my father was ostracized and vilified from his own Japanese-American community. And, and went it alone. He, he was still determined. So, you know, fast, fast forward, I mean, after, um, you know, when his, his um, the decision came down in, on December 18th, 1944 from the Supreme Court, and next year is the 75th commemoration or anniversary of that case, uh, that he was, he was a word that he, he used, and it was a strong word at that time, disgusted. He was really disgusted that the Supreme Court had come to this decision. Uh, and, but, but he got on with his life and uh, ended up marrying my, my mother. They met in Detroit, Michigan, and then moved back to, uh, to California uh, because back then my, my mother was from South Carolina, so they couldn't go to South Carolina to marry. And even California did not change their laws uh, until 1948. So the, you know, the intermarriage laws were, were very strong. This is way before Loving versus Virginia, mind you. Um, so it in uh, so my brother and I grew up in in the uh, in the East Bay, and uh, I was um, 16 years old and in high school studying U.S. government, uh, 
and our U.S. government teacher had issued um, a little paperback book for each student to read and of a different subject and, 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 and get up and uh, give an oral book report. That was a long time ago. I mean, they don't even do that now. Uh, and I don't remember what my book was, but my friend, Maya, third generation Japanese American, Sansei, her book was called Concentration Camps USA. Think about that. And, uh, and then she talks about the uh, Japanese you know, internment. That's what they used that word back then. And she describes this period in time, and I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. I never had heard about that before. And then she went on to say, but there was this one man who resisted the military orders, and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. Oh, that's my name. <laughs> and I had 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me, and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking, that's some black sheep of the family, because she never said Fred. And so after class, I said, Maya, what's this about? And she says, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. Somebody would have told me. So uh, you know, I go running home, and I get the standard answer from my mother. <clears throat> yes, that is your father. You'll have to wait till he gets home and ask him. <laughs> and not only did my father have housing discrimination, he'd had employment discrimination, as many people Jap of Japanese ancestry did. And he worked two jobs, and he got home at 8 o'clock at night. And by that time, I had calmed down. And I asked him you know, what this was about, and he said, it happened a long time ago, and what he did he thought was right, and the government was wrong. That clear and simple. And I could see this hurt going over his eyes, and it was like somebody just socked me in the stomach. So I couldn't ask any more questions about that time. But I did ask him, I said, can you vote? For Voting was very important to my parents. They always studied the ballot. So my message here is remember to vote. Uh, don't let that opportunity pass you by and hope you've registered by now. So, uh, uh, and, and the irony to the story is that my younger brother, who's four years younger, uh, and learned about my father's Supreme Court case in high school. So obviously we didn't have dinner talk, is what I say. Uh, but we, my father and I didn't talk about this um, anymore until, until one day my father receives a letter from Professor Peter Irons who says uh, that he's, uh, doing, you know, he's been doing research on a book. He wants to write a book uh, about the World War II Supreme Court cases. And my dad thought, well, here we go again, because all along he'd, he'd get phone calls and people wouldn't, wanted to interview him, law students wanted to interview him, and he, he just didn't want to talk about it. It was just way too painful. And, uh, and, but Peter was persistent, and he, he called, and he, then, he, then he said that he had some evidence that he wanted to show my dad. So they make an arrangement, and I'm one of the, I was very protective of my father, and I was, you know, my, my career, well, no, my former career, actually, I was a hotel and restaurant designer, so I had my own design firm, and I was traveling around, and my mother was picking me up from the airport, because I knew Peter was going to be there, and we were, I was really suspicious, it's like, you know, what does this guy have? So um, we walked in, actually, as, towards the end of the conversation, but Peter had this, this file of documents, and he, he, the research that he had done, he had look, been looking in citizenship files, right, in that department. But finally, he went over to um, immigration and naturalization and learned that there was a box there. Now, this box had not been looked at in 40 years. It was covered in dust and rope. And he opened it up, and, it, and on top was the smoking gun, was the only document uh, left. The other, it was, there was 10 documents, t 10 copies made, and all nine had been destroyed except this one, and this one was on top. And it's from the Department of Justice. It's a memo that says, we are lying to the Supreme Court. So the evidence showed that at the time of my father's Supreme Court hearing, the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, had altered evidence, and destroyed evidence. Uh, and the briefs that go to the Supreme Court, um, actually there had been a footnote in it that said, 
you know, the, the evidence was the U.S. Um, Navy wrinkle report sh uh, showed that there was never any evidence of any spying or espionage from any Japanese or Japanese American on the West Coast. Also, J. Edgar Hoover, of all people, um, from the FBI, also made the same statement. And that was in the footnote of this brief going to the Supreme Court. So General DeWitt learned about that, and they destroyed all those briefs. All those briefs were destroyed, and they had to reprint that without the footnote. Who knows what the Supreme Court's decision would have made if they had tr the true evidence at the time. So, uh, so on that basis, you know, uh, my father said to, to, to Peter, well, you know, will you be my, my attorney? And not until that time did I learn that my father had never given up hope for almost 40 years that someday he could reopen his Supreme Court case. But he didn't know how to do that because attorneys were expensive. Uh, and Peter being the, the, I wish he could be here because, you know, this, he has a beard and very professorial and a uh, big heart. And, but he, he thought, you know, he's not the person really to take the lead on this case. That he knew that the Japanese American attorneys were the ones. So he's the one that contacted Dale Manami that he, he um, had heard of in the, in the Bay Area. They had been working actually on redress and reparations already. And, uh, and there was a core of, of attorneys that we've been working together. And so he contacted Dale and said, you know, what he had. And, and of course, Dale and, and some of the others' reaction was, well, is Fred still alive? You know, it was, it was kind of one of those reactions. You know, because as uh, many law students know, you know, th th these, these cases are black and white, you know, in a, in a, in a law book. And, but at the end of the day, they are about real people. Uh, and, 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 and that's the beauty of being able to share this, this story. So Dale put together this, this Quorum Nobis team, and for some of you that, that don't know, it's, it's writ of error Quorum Nobis. It's a little unknown procedure um, that actually Peter had used for himself uh, because of the Vietnam War. So it's, in other words, it, it, you've, served your, you've served your sentence. Um, in this case, it was, it was probation. And, uh, and, but you found the evidence that uh, error has been made. So the, the Latin kind of uh, interpretation, if you will, is an error has been made before us. An error has been made before the court. And that's how they were able to reopen my father's Supreme Court case and, and Gordon Hirabayashi's and Min Yasui's. Uh, it was, it, and they decided, Dale was brilliant in saying, well, okay, we need to, to create these uh, legal teams. And you know, so there was one in Washington for Gordon, one in, in Portland for, for men, and one in San Francisco for my father. So they like, would have like three bites of the apple. Uh, so they would have three chances in, in case you know, one lose, and, and then we'd have an opportunity to, you know, to go further up. But uh, in, uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, they had to actually work in secret. So they worked in secret and not, didn't let anyone know that they had these documents because they were afraid that the government would find out. And so Don, Don Tamaki, who was one of the other attorneys, would call up people in the, in the community and say, um, uh, we're working on this uh, case and uh, uh, it affects our community. We can't tell you about it, but we need money. So I thought it was a great fundraising tactic that I that I uh, that I should be using. Um, anyway, so they 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 on November 10th, 1983, Judge Marilyn Hall Patel issued actually um, her opinion from the bench, which is very unusual. And and it was a day in court that all Japanese Americans that had been incarcerated were able to to witness. And they over you know vacated um, and overturned my father's federal conviction. So at that time. You know, he no longer had a, a prison record because he had even tried to uh, acquire a real estate license because he wanted to help people since he had been discriminated with housing. And he was denied because he had a prison record. So uh, th those were kind, kinds of, of, of the injustices that, that, that occurred to him. And, uh, and so, you know, there was no basis then for appeal, right? You have to, the, as we know, the Supreme Court can only overrule itself. Um, the, um, um, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, th these, these opinions th that Karen was talking about, the dissenting opinions from the Supreme Court, were the ones that are still, you know, most, in, most important today. 
And, uh, and the findings from the 1983 uh, decision was governmental misconduct, right? So it was governmental misconduct. And of course, it was based on military necessity, which we not now call national security. Um, and that's, and, you know, and, but my father, he could have said, well, Japanese American community, I don't want anything to do with you because you didn't want anything to do with me. But he wasn't like that. And he never blamed anyone. He was not a, a, a person that uh, was angry uh, or blamed anyone. He just, he knew that the government was wrong and he was right to stand up for what he did. Uh, and so he, that's why he crisscrossed this country speaking because he didn't want something like the incarceration to happen again. And, uh, and received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in, in 1998 for, for all that work. So uh, you never know what's gonna happen to someone's legacy. Uh, that's in two, my father gave me the charge to carry on with education. I didn't know how I was gonna do that. But in 2009, we established the Korematsu Institute. And we focus on K through 12 education, so um, primarily, but we have um, curriculum that we send out to teachers free of charge. And I now have impacted all 50 states, work with the National Council for Social Studies, and even 12 countries have um, ordered our curriculum kits because they look at the Japanese American incarceration as a human rights violation. Uh, and we are still experiencing human rights violations now. Uh, so um, I will end there and let Adam talk, and then I will make a conclusion uh, about the uh, opinion uh, of Justice, uh, or of the Supreme Court, Justice Roberts in Trump versus Hawaii. I, I feel compelled to mention that Don Tamaki uh, to whom Ms. Karamatsu just referred, was a student of mine at Berkeley and credits me with his decision to go to law school. Yeah. And when I went to law school, I was a classmate of Peter Irons. Yeah. I have lots of connections Comes to this full case. circle. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be here with Karen and Karen and Michael. <clears throat> I'm going to try to bring us to the present. And sometimes when you, you know, talk about two cases, you have to force the comparisons. The Korematsu case, <clears throat> the travel ban case, uh, Trump against Hawaii. But here, it doesn't require a lot of work to see the echoes and through lines. And I want to explore with you about what happened to the loaded gun that Justice Jackson described. Uh, I want to take you back to the presidential campaign, 2015. Uh, Donald Trump is talking. And he says that the things you probably remember well. He says, I'm calling very simply for a shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Uh, he said that kind of thing all the time. But on one occasion, he said this. Take a look at what FDR did many years ago. This is a president who was highly respected by all. And then this next part cracks me up because you might wonder, is he highly respected of all because you know he waged World War II or pressed the New Deal? No, he was highly respected at all because they named highways after him. So apparently, <laughs> Donald Trump has driven down the FDR drive. <laughs> now, you might think that that kind of direct comparison would cause the Supreme Court to pause when it's considering uh, whether to uphold President Trump's travel ban. Now, the travel ban is actually a series of three executive orders. The first one issued just a week after he takes office. Uh, it's when many of us got our first glimpse of what candidate Trump would be like as President Trump. And you remember chaos at the borders, uh, chaos at the airports, court decisions blocking the move, a subsequent executive order. That one expires. And finally, um, in September 2017, um, the presidential proclamation that bans most travel from initially eight countries, six of the majority Muslim. And the, then the question is, is this what he was talking about on the campaign trail, or is it something else? Uh, the Solicitor General, in defending that third travel ban, really had to you know, perform linguistic somersaults. Uh, 
to try to disassociate the campaign statements from the proclamation, which was, unlike the military orders in Korematsu, neutral on its face. And so let me read you, you know, one, one passage from one brief that gives you a sense of how to try to make this sound in lawyerly talk. Impugning the official objective of a formal national security and foreign policy judgment of the president based on campaign trail statements is inappropriate and fraught with intractable difficulties. Uh, the uh, people challenging the travel ban, the case that made it to the Supreme Court was brought by Hawaii, several individuals and a Muslim group took a different view. They said the travel ban, the presidential proclamation was the fulfillment of the president's promise to prohibit Muslim immigration to, to the United States. Um, there were some very good uh, amicus briefs in the case, including from Karen's group, uh, in which the through line between the two cases was drawn directly. Uh, one of them wrote, history teaches caution and skepticism when vague notions of national security are used to justify vast, unprecedented exclusionary measures that target disfavored classes, uh, a brief said. Now, I, I, in fairness, there are distinctions between the two cases. One of them, as Karen was saying, involved American citizens being moved to internment camps. Uh, the travel ban involves people living abroad seeking co to come to the United States. I'm not saying that that's a distinction that necessarily makes a difference, but it is a distinction. And as I mentioned a second ago, uh, <clears throat> the Trump travel ban on its face uh, does not uh, say we're going to exclude Muslims. It just happens to affect 100 million Muslims. Um, now, the, the Korematsu decision occupies a special place in uh, American legal history. It's part of what Jamal uh, Green calls the anti-canon. Uh, it's, it's one of those cases that everyone is allowed to uh, dislike, uh, that when a Supreme Court nominee uh, is questioned, they, they will tell you almost nothing about cases that were correctly decided or incorrectly decided, but they'll say Dred Scott was wrong, they see Plessy against Ferguson was wrong, and they'll say Korematsu was wrong. In fact, Justice Scalia wrote that Korematsu ranks with Dred, Dred Scott as one of the court's most disastrous rulings. The uh, Congress, in uh, concluding that the internment of J Japanese Americans was a grave injustice animated by race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership, uh, leadership uh, also <clears throat> disavowed the decision. But it was uh, just recently and a little equivocally that the Supreme Court <clears throat> finally uh, more or less overruled, or at least uh, disavowed. But we'll hear a little bit more from Karen about exactly what the court did in um, uh, in disavowing the case. Uh, it's also true that Neil Katyal in 2011, then the acting United States Solicitor General, and later the lawyer who represented the challengers in uh, Trump against Hawaii, also apologized, issued a confession of error for the misstatements uh, Karen described. And I want to come back to that too, because there are echoes of the current Solicitor General's statements to the Supreme Court with what happened in Korematsu. Um, I think you're generally familiar with the upshot of the case in June, uh, five to four, divided along the typical ideological lines, the five Republican appointees in the majority, the four Democratic appointees in dissent, uphold the third travel ban. Uh, the basic idea is that the president has vast statutory and constitutional authority over immigration, particularly when inflected with national security, uh, that the majority said they're not going to look behind the four corners of the proclamation and take account of uh, campaign statements and other statements suggesting what the true reason behind the travel ban was. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts basically says, 
listen, we're making a ruling about the presidency, not this particular president. Uh, two dissents, one fairly mild from Justices Breyer and Kagan, saying if they could be convinced that mm, procedures for making exceptions in particular cases were more robust, they might be willing to go along, but they're not. And a very, very tough dissent from Justice Sotomayor, joined by Justice Ginsburg. And <clears throat> uh, I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for that. <clears throat> and the most pointed parts of the Sotomayor dissent were a reference to Korematsu. Um, she writes, uh, today's holding is all the more troubling given the stark parallels between the reasoning of this case and that of Korematsu. As here, the government invoked an ill-defined national security threat to justify an exclusionary pos uh, policy of sweeping proportions. Uh, and there's a lot more of that in that vein. She uh, read her dissent from the bench, uh, which is uncommon, uh, is an indication of really deep disagreement with the majority's decision. And the courtroom was hushed, and she laid into the uh, Chief Justice in a way that made it a good idea for them to take a three-month summer break. <laughs> um, Chief Justice Roberts then uh, writes an interesting, again, I'm going to defer to Karen on exactly what it was, but he disavows Korematsu. <clears throat> he says, whatever rhetorical advantage the dissent may see in doing so, Korematsu has nothing to do with this case. The forcible relocation of US citizens to concentration camps, solely and explicitly on the basis of race, is objectively unlawful and outside the scope of presidential authority, but it is wholly inapt to liken the mor that morally repugnant order to a facially neutral policy denying certain foreign nationals the privilege of admission. The entry uh, suspension is an act that is well within executive authority and could have been taken by any other president. The only question is evaluating the actions of this particular president promulgating an otherwise valid proclamation. And then here he makes his move uh, disavowing Korematsu. The dissent's reference to Korematsu, however, affords this court the opportunity to make express what is already obvious. Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, at least, maybe not in the Supreme Court, overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, now quoting Justice Jackson, has no place in law under the Constitution. Uh, I was struck, among other things, by his reference to concentration camps. I used that phrase in my story the next day, and I got a lot of pushback saying, you know, Liptak, that's pretty strong to call them concentration camps. I'm saying, I didn't call them, that was the Chief Justice talking. Um, and then the last point I'll make is about uh, the Solicitor General's uh, misstatement. And I think this, this exchange is quite telling. Uh, Neil Katyal is asked by the Chief Justice, so listen, if President Trump were tomorrow simply to disavow the Muslim ban, as he really never has, and say no, I, I want to do something different here. I realized in the campaign I spoke about a Muslim ban, but this is, I'm, I've consulted with the cabinet secretaries. They've made a national security judgment that our screening procedures in a hand, large handful, double handful of countries is not good enough. And Katyal goes, that's fine. We don't say that there's anything wrong with the proclamation as such. We're saying what's wrong with it is the motivation behind it. Okay. Uh, then the Solicitor General, Noel Francisco, gets up and he says, well, we've already done that. The President has already done that. He, I'm quoting him now, he has made crystal clear that Muslims in this country are great Americans, uh, and he misspeaks a little bit, and there are many, many Muslim countries who love this country, and he has praised Islam, uh, and he says that the President has made crystal clear on September 25th that he has no intention of imposing a Muslim ban. Um, I, I reported that. I didn't think to look back at whatever he said on September 25th. In fact, on September 25th, Donald Trump uh, uncharacteristically was silent. Uh, he certainly said nothing about the travel ban or a Muslim ban or anything else. And when this was pointed out, uh, General Francisco, 
wrote a corrective letter to the court saying, I know I referred to September 25th. In fact, I meant to refer to January 25th. And on that day, President Trump gave an interview to ABC News. And I'll read it, and you make the judgment about whether this is crystal clear or whether it is typical Trump word salad. Um, it's not a Muslim ban, but it's countries that have tremendous terror. People are going to come in and cause us tremendous problems. So that was the crystal clear statement on a different date that General Francisco said was sufficient to overcome uh, all of what was said during the campaign. Um, so I submit that the through lines, the framing, the parallels, the echoes between Korematsu and the Trump against Hawaii travel ban case are significant. And now I'm eager to hear Karen's thoughts on what she thinks of the supposed overruling. Um, I have to tell you that um, in April, uh, I was in uh, the Supreme Court uh, for the oral argument. And that's the first time I've ever experienced an oral argument in the Supreme Court, which is quite an experience. Um, if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it, I was quite surprised because the, I mean, the justices clearly have read all, all, the, all the briefs and, and have done all their homework and their, their law clerks have given them information uh, and, and probably showed them, you know, the, like the, amic the amicus brief that I supported. Um, but the, the questions were, they just were like bantering back and forth. Uh, interrupting each other, and the uh, and the attorneys hardly got a, a word in edgewise. It was uh, was really quite interesting. But because in um, in the other uh, like the the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, it always kind of came up like, is this another Korematsu? Is this another Korematsu? Which is kind of you know when your name's Korematsu <laughs> and it's an unusual Japanese name, it kind of gives you a funny feeling. Um, but uh, so it was brought up in those instances, and, and but in this case um, at the Supreme Court, uh, no one ever even you know brought up uh, Korematsu at all. Uh, actually, uh, Justice um, Breyer did. You know, somebody said, um, uh, "Well, this has nothing to do with citizens." And you know, Justice Breyer says, "Well, this has to do with with families in America, where you know they're, they're, they have relatives in in other Muslim countries. And what about businesses that want to bring over, um, you know, immigrants to to work in this country? It's about economics. So, I mean, clearly, everyone was kind of losing sight of the whole of the whole point." Um, uh, and we weren't quite sure how this was going to turn out. So on, in June on 26, when the when the opinion was issued, um, my cell phone sitting next to my bed. I'm in San Francisco, and it lights up at seven o'clock in the morning because I think it's about ten when they issued the the decision. And 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 it said um, my consultant in D.C. said uh, uh, um, um, Hawaii um, or I should say um, Muslim, Muslim ban upheld. Uh, travel ban upheld, Korematsu overruled. And I thought, what? I mean, even though in our, you know, amicus brief, what, what it was, and I've signed some other amicus briefs. My, brother, my father did. So I, I kind of wear two hats. I'm the executive director of the Fred Korematsu Institute, and we focus on education, and we're nonpartisan. But I do comment on those... Um, uh, those policies of the government that are in, uh, that are in you know contradiction to what my father's values were, and what he upheld, and what the, the justice that he he fought for. So um, I've signed my name to I think now like five different you know amicus briefs, and 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 this one the point of this one was to remind the the court, you know of use my father's case to remind the court of of because the parallels obviously between the Japanese American incarceration. And and the way that the um, you know the, the the Muslims have been targeted and and the the travel ban uh, and the immigration issues the the parallel is strong the Japanese Americans the Japanese American community the JACL my father were the first ones to to even speak up after 2000 um, and one you know 9/11 after 9/11 uh, when there was talk that. Actually, Attorney General Ashcroft cited my father's Supreme Court case as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in, in American concentration camps. 
So, you know, that's kind of the, the relevancy of, of Korematsu. Uh, and the, um, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, was the point of, of the, uh, the amicus brief, but also to remind the court of, you know, the, you know, the, the possibility of overreaching of power uh, from the executive branch, because clearly that's, that's the way we felt what was happening at the time, and that the, you know, the, uh, the branches need to be separate and autonomous, uh, and we wanted to remind the court of, of that as well. Uh, so it was really, you know, quite a, a surprise. But then I uh, read, um, you know, and just to, to kind of carry on about Justice Sotomayor, usually Justice Sotomayor writes a dissent and she says, I respectfully dissent. In this case, she just ended it with, I dissent. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, Supreme, the justices all know what the decisions are going to be made, you know, what, what her dissent's going to be, and, and they read that ahead of time. Roberts did as well. But the fact that he says in, in, in his conclusion, uh, uh, in the decision, that Korematsu has nothing to do with this case. In other words, Korematsu has nothing to do with Trump versus Hawaii. But then goes on to say, you know, that, that Korematsu is overruled. Now, it's like they used, he used my father's case in a kind of a offhanded, in retaliation to what Justice Sotomayor wrote. Because he upholds the Muslim travel ban, overrules, quote unquote, because it's the way he did it is still suspect. Korematsu, and you know, and undermines uh, another group of people, another you know, the Muslims, and, and marginalizes another group of people, all in the same breath. So, in my opinion, Justice Roberts dishonored my father. That's not what the Supreme Court should be doing. They should have, have a, a bit more uh, sense and responsibility of, of, uh, and respect. In this case, all respect was, was denied. That seems to be the tone of this presidency as well. So if my father were here, however, because I know that he would be, quote, disgusted, uh, you know, first I was stunned, then I was sad because I knew my father would be so upset. And, and then I became outraged and more determined than ever to keep speaking out, to keep reminding people, and keep educating. And so my father would say to you to remember to stand up for what is right, and when you see something wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our speakers for such a marvelous program. And now we have time, about 20 minutes, for Q&A. And uh, Lakin King, raise your hand, Lakin, back there. Uh, she has the only microphone that's going to register. So if you have questions, make yourself known to Lakin King, and she will come around with her microphone, and you can be heard. Are there any questions? I get more questions than five-year-olds. <laughs> there was one right here. This on? Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is. It is. All right. Uh, I, I had a question with regard to immigration. Um, do you see any comparisons, because we're talking about immigration bans, right, to the exclusion acts and immigration of 1924, uh, which banned all Japanese um, from coming to this country? So are there any parallels that any of the panel sees uh, that are similar or different? Karen? You're the, you're the professor. <laughs> 
um, yeah, I mean that's a wonderful question, and I think that you know that I think I think you're you're right to suggest that there are parallels. I think, you know, the story in immigration history we tell us this story about um, a sort of arc of justice, right? That we sort of no longer do that anymore. There's this sense that oh no, that you know those are sort of the bad old days. But I think that um, the Trump travel ban suggests that there is, you know, another persistent theme in our history, and it's that we, you know, we do do it that way, right? So we, you know, the, the legacy of the Chinese exclusion next, right? This is very much still um, part of our history, and I think it is, you know, now there's a religious valence, but there's a, you know, there's still a racialized um, aspect of it as well. So, you know, absolutely, I would say that's kind of deeply embedded our, in our history, and, you know, we see it in our politics every day. A, a difficult part of these comparisons, these cases, is that people living abroad don't have constitutional rights. And even in the Trump case, it was only because of their relationship to people in the states and groups in the states and places they might like to work or study that they were able to get into the courts. So it's a little, it, it may well, there, it's possible for something to be profoundly offensive and yet still be on the reach of the Constitution. <laughs> I, I just want to add that Mr. Liptak talked about Justice Sotomayor's dissent. The real guts of that dissent is a litany of all the things that Trump said about Muslims and about immigration, including after he became president. So it actually goes, the argument that this was just campaign rhetoric, mm -hmm. she really shows that, that uh, she really just rips that apart. Mm -hmm. And there, there was a moment, in, and this is in the written decision, but it was even more powerful when she spoke it, she goes through all these statements, and the statements, as you know, are appalling. Uh, and she says, let that sink in. That's the President of the United States talking. And, and I have to add, so Justice Kennedy, on the day before he announced his resignation, uh, issues a concurrence where he goes along with the decision, and then he says, but don't, to the rest of the world, don't worry, our values are still the same, even though he just voted to shred them. Any more? Um, more questions, yes. I have a question for Mr. Liptak. Um, as a watcher of the court, were you surprised by the decision? I mean, was there a sense that they were trying to not have a five to four ideological split? Or was it, um, it just seemed like that was what it was gonna be even in the oral arguments? Um, I thought there was a great deal of bargaining going on behind the scenes. And I think the Breyer and Kagan concurrence was an attempt to find some sort of middle ground. Um, I'm sure that Chief Justice Roberts would have given up quite a lot to pick up a sixth or seventh vote. Um, and the fact that that dissent from those two, the more moderate of the two liberals, was so mild is, a, is an indication that there was some attempt at compromise going on. It didn't work. All of the hands, Lincoln. <laughs> um, so, hello. Um, so you <clears throat> discussed uh, that I know that executive power is expanded during like wartime and national security threats, but are there any like legitimate and concrete thresholds as to what circumstances qualify to be like? a time of war or a national security threat? Like, how do you actually determine that? You, it, you determine it by making arguments to nine people and they make something up. Yeah. Um, also, you should know, I mean, if you read the, the Constitution, uh, the, you know, the Constitution gives, uh, you know, executive power to the president. It doesn't, it doesn't specifically uh, name executive orders. Um, but the history of executive orders goes back to our first president, uh, Washington. And actually, those executive orders were used really as military directives uh, until about the time that, that uh, President um, Roosevelt then issued the, the 9066. So it's, it's, you know, certainly this is being discussed now because it's such a, a gray area of, of you know, what an executive order is and what the executive power means.
Just one final point that I would make as a historian. I think one thing that we need to keep our eye on is not just um, what is the scope of the war power, but what are the arguments that are being made about when is the time of war, so when is war time. Um, and I think we've also seen war time mm -hmm. expand. So um, the historian Mary Dudjack has a wonderful book on this, showing just, you know, it used to be in our imagination, we think of war time as a, just a, a discrete time, and everybody knows it's war time, right? That's sort of the language in these cases that I described. And I think what we're seeing now is war time is infinite time. War time is all the time. Um, and I think that, so that just makes that question sort of all the more uh, vital to ask. Hi, so I'm from El Paso, Texas, which is 35 miles from Tornillo, and Tornillo has the tent city. Uh, locally, we call it an internment camp or a concentration camp. I think now there's around 3,000 children in the camp, and they're seeking to expand it, maybe even turn Fort Bliss into a camp for adults as well. So I'm wondering if the Kodematsu Institute is doing anything around this, or if there's like Japanese-American activism in other places that are trying to connect to this issue. Well, um, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, we're speaking up a, a, against that that separation. Um, uh, oh gosh, Senator, he's from Oregon, Merkley, Minkley, Merkley, Merkley, right? Just issued a um, or just uh, 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 introduced a bill um, on um, at at Congress called um, "No More Internment Camps." And then, uh, and so I've supported that as, as uh, many of the other, you know, Japanese American, you know, communities, um, organizations have as, as well. Um, you know, the, the, also the difference between, you know, 1942 and, and 2018, is at least, you know, in 1942, there were not the organizations to speak up and help the Japanese Americans. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the Quakers were peaceful. Um, you know, the ACLU uh, uh, leadership, you know, was, was not speaking out because they were all friends of Roosevelt. No one wanted to go against the president, right? Uh, and, uh, and at least now we have the organizations uh, to, to, uh, to speak up and to work across communities uh, and to support these different issues and, and try to get some legislation through so that we can stop this um, inhumane treatment of separating uh, children from families because I mean they did that in in uh, in 1942 as well <coughs> I'm sorry I I don't know if this is a political or a hi historical question but I think probably most people would agree that Franklin Roosevelt and Donald Trump are quite different <laughs> from one another <laughs> and and in the Trump case I think we could probably also agree that at least a major, if not the sole motivation behind the travel ban was the sort of naked determination to keep a campaign promise to his base, mm -hmm. right? I'm not as clear on what the panelists are saying was the motivation behind the Japanese incarceration in the mind of Franklin Roosevelt. Was it, he was not without race prejudice. We know that from other circumstances too. But was there, a, was there an analogy to the political situation? Was he trying to please a constituency? Did he really believe in the security threat, which apparently the Justice Department didn't believe in? What could you, might you add to the, the, the driving motivation behind these well, events? You know, the incarceration, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the back story to the incarceration really is economics. And, uh, you know, as we do in this country, we go to other countries like, you know, to, you know, China for the re recruited, um, you know, Chinese people to work on the railroads. You know, went to Japan at that time, at the ter last turn of the century, uh, the economy in Japan was very poor. And uh, they, the government wanted cheap labor to, to work in the agriculture uh, up and down the, the West Coast. And so they went into the five prefectures or five counties of Japan that were heavily agricultural agricultural and recruited people like my grandfather to come you know come work in America land of opportunity and you know that sort of thing and you know here we've done that with the Mexicans and the Latinos you know they and then we get this this well they're taking away our jobs you know that's the the mantra they're you know taking away our jobs and um, and so there was a big um, you know uh, DeWitt was in, in in California so there was a, a, a big pushback from these different uh, organizations in uh, uh, agricultural organizations in California against the Japanese because the Japanese um, nationals were doing so well with um, with agriculture. I mean, they were making money. They had some land. 
Um, and uh, and it, was, it was the same thing, you know, they were taking away our jobs. And so there was a big push to, you know, get, let's get rid of them, send them back. You know, that's, that's what we do in this country. We, we, you know, we want them to work for peanuts, we treat them like slaves and then send them back. I mean, that's, you know, that's the story. Only so only. that was the main, the, the really big main backstory to it. Only this time they didn't send them back, they sent them to camps and basically right. seized all their property or had to sell it for a song. Right. And this is General DeWitt who actually did have Roosevelt's ear. Right. Um, who said, famously said on two occasions, including one in print, a Jap is a Jap is a Jap, and you can't make a distinction between a citizen and a non-citizen. So, and that was, um, uh, that was a big part um, of the type of thinking that was around Roosevelt at the time. Hi. Uh, my question is for uh, Ms. Koromatsu. I um, just want to mention that I'm a Yonsei, uh, fourth uh, generation Japanese American. Um, my grandparents were also interned at Manzanar, and my godfather was interned at uh, Lake Boston in Arizona. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your contributions to the JA community. Uh, my question is geared more towards the attitudes and the backlash that your father may have received during and maybe a little bit after the war about how um, they may not have seen um, the contributions of your father as particularly patriotic. Um, my relatives uh, served in you know units like the 100th uh, Military Intelligence, and you know their colleagues served in the 442nd, and they went off to Europe to fight. So they may have differing definitions of you know what it is to you know be patriotic. Um, can you tell me more about uh, how there may have been some reconciliation, or if there was continued pushback against your father uh, after the war? Oh well, yeah. Thank you for asking that question because there was. Um, you know, my my father was a very quiet, you know, kind person, and and so he, you know, got on with his life, and as I said, never gave up hope to someday he could reopen up his his Supreme Court case. And he was part of the community, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church, elder in the church, Lions Club. He was, you know, president of his local Lions Club chapter uh, twice, and was a member for 58 and a half years, and. And so that's the kind of community, you know, service that my, my parents showed. But we were not, my brother and I and our family were not part of the Japanese American community. Um, I had cousins that, you know, we associated with and, and, uh, and, and actually there was, in the end there was no really, you know, we, it's not like we didn't talk within the family, we did. Um, I mean, we were, you know, when we were a, as a family, I mean, actually when I was growing up, my, my father's youngest brother, uh, 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 told uh, my cousins not to, to ask my father about his Supreme Court case. They had learned it about it in school and said, "Oh, is this Uncle Fred?" And, and you know, my uncle Joe said, "Yes, but don't ask, don't ask him. If he wants to talk about it, then he'll he'll speak about it." And so, um, it was. It, it, we weren't part of the community until 1983. I mean, I I didn't even feel. I had I mean, my Asian American roots until that time. I was 33 years old. I mean, you know, that's when I started getting more involved in, in, in our own community. But, and, and so when they re actually had this evidence to reopen my father's case, and it was kind of known in the community, because of the redress and reparations movement, the community at large did not want my father to reopen up his case. There was pushback, because they thought that if my father lost his Supreme Court case again, that, that that would lose their chance for redress and reparations. So in fact, you know, because his his federal conviction was overturned, it set the precedent really for the for the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, and even the president of the JACL admitted that. So, but it it it, it didn't it didn't change my father. You know, it's just amazing. It didn't change it, my father at all. It just uh, because when he received these honors, you know, like the the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I mean, he did it on behalf of of everyone that had been incarcerated, and uh, and 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 that's the kind of you know person that he was, and um, and it and it made him upset that you know here he was targeted uh, targeted because you know he he looked like the ed enemy, and you know I learned that that you know being an American, I mean, because there's there's the, the, the other parts of the story of the incarceration, which is even happening w within the, the Muslim community today of, of people that are, are very af afraid and that are, you know, kind of resist. And, you know, there were resistors, there's Japanese American resistors and, and the no-nos to do with the loyalty questionnaire. And what I say is there's different ways to demonstrate what it is to be an American. And to be an American in this country, we need to support citizens and non-citizens. That's being an American. 
We have time for about two more questions. I'd like to turn this around to those of you in the audience that rather than sit and be very appreciative of the panel and all you learned, you can do something. You can call New York State's governor before the election because he wants to make brownie points. You can call and say, New York State should declare Fred Korematsu Day. It's only a New York City day so far. We need to have a New York State. I just love it. Now, the second thing is that the New York City school teachers do not know anything about camps or about Fred Korematsu because Teachers College of your Columbia University doesn't have in their social studies curriculum anything about the camps to teach the teachers here how to teach the children about it. So how can we have Fred Korematsu Day in the schools if the teachers don't know anything about it or about the camps? And probably some of them don't know too much about the Constitution. So I, I think it, it's a sad, sad state, but there's very little Eastern or Middle Eastern or Pacific Islander history in the city of New York. Having grown up here, I was lucky. I went to the Teachers College Lab School, Horace Mann Lincoln, right down the street. And I grew up here, but, but my mother being under house arrest during the war, and I didn't know anything about it. It was very typical, as Karen didn't learn about what happened with her father. I didn't know my mother was under house arrest, and I thought it was very strange that she called our father every morning and said, I'm gonna take the children to school, okay? You know, we didn't get it until about 20 years later when she mm -hmm. told us. But there's something you can each do. You can call your state senator, you can call your governor, you can call your New York City mayor and say, get that curriculum in the schools. You can call the new president of Teachers College who's gonna be inaugurated very shortly. You can call him and say, get a, a curriculum item so that all of your teachers can in New York City teach about Fred Korematsu. There's a lot you can do as students, and if some of you are from the law school, just think how much influence you could have in five, 10 years. So, you know, don't sit back and, and just say, that was very interesting. Do something, because you have an obligation not only to vote, but to make the people who are doing something about your vote do something. I want you to call on my student. I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair and call on my student, Katie Gillis. Do I need the microphone? Oh, yes. Okay. I can also project. Um, you should. Yeah, I don't know. It's on. Okay. My question is geared most towards Adam Liptek. I just want to thank everyone for being here, but um, kind of without taking us too far off that wonderful um, call to action, also just bring this a little bit closer to date and ask if you can speak a little bit to the child separation policy um, that was kind of struck down by the California Southern District Court. And if you could speculate a little bit about whether or not the current kind of Honduran migrants bringing that back mm. onto Trump's uh, table, if this could pr uh, potentially become a Supreme Court legal issue. It's, it's one of sort of countless cases where the Trump administration keeps losing the lower courts. Sanctuary cities, DACA, um, child separation. And I think the Trump administration won't do well in the Ninth Circuit either. Um, but the Supreme Court is tougher. The Supreme Court, uh, even with Kennedy on it, and now even more so with Kavanaugh on it, is inclined to defer to presidential power in areas it thinks are largely committed to the president, uh, immigration and national security. That said, though, of that array of cases I just described, I think child separation is one that uh, really troubles people and troubles people across the ideological spectrum in which, say, sanctuary cities, sanctuary jurisdictions might not. So I'm not prepared to predict, and it would depend a lot on the posture it arrives at the court, I'm not prepared to predict that that's one of the many cases where the Supreme Court might act differently from the lower courts. I just don't know. So we are out of time. I want to thank our panelists.
I also want to thank the people who asked such stimulating questions and made such remarkable observations. And I hope you all uh, will give a round of applause to our panel.